Warning, this podcast may contain graphic and triggering content. Please listen at your own risk. Each individual struggle is different and everyone's recovery and healing journey is different. Please reach out to a certified medical professional if you need help. Welcome to episode 13 of Stomp the Stigma, the podcast aimed to fight the stigma surrounding mental health through education, awareness, experiences, stories, resources, and the vulnerable truth. Joining me to Stomp the Stigma today is Shelly Qualteri. She's a registered social worker right here in Calgary with her own private practice, and she's here to share her perspectives and expertise on everything mental health. Hello. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I am good. Thank you. Sorry, I was just finishing up with my client, so I apologize. That's okay. (laughs) That's okay. I know you're busy. Um, I wanted to thank you for coming on and taking the time to sit down and chat with me. I know you're super busy. It's totally good. It's fun. I like being able to do podcasts that are not my own. (laughs) Do you like being on the other side of, of, of an interview, I guess? Well, it's just nice because then you get exposure to other people's audiences as well. Yeah. And you get to learn more about like the other person, you know, like mm-hmm. it's just a good conversation. And I think because I am the one talking and asking questions all day, yeah. I like sometimes when people ask me a question. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. And so then are you um, like, how did you get started with your podcast? Um, okay. Growing up, I had my own mental health struggles. Um, I, I struggle with depression and BPD myself. And so growing up, there was no really resources or people didn't really talk about it at all. And I had nowhere to really turn. And I felt so alone and like nobody really understood what I was going through and nobody else was, um, kind of going through the same experiences. And so, I just kind of realized, like, even locally, there's still not a lot of talk about these kinds of things. And I wanted to start a podcast just to get that conversation going with other people's stories and uh, local resources and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's awesome. Because you've had some like good guests on there. There was one I was listening to. Um, she was an athlete, hockey player, rugby player, or something like that. And she had thoughts of suicide. Oh, yeah, Krista, she, the very first one. Yeah, yeah and I was like, player. oh, my gosh, this is, like, so emotional and powerful for people. Like, <laughs> yeah. there's probably people who are, like, crying in their cars listening to someone, like, talking about their story and their mom. <laughs> well, I find that listening to other people's stories has helped me. Um, even just understanding what I've been through and feeling not so alone. So I wanted to share people's stories. Um, I know it can be kind of triggering for some people, but I think um, it can also help a lot of people. Oh, for well, sure. So. Yeah, because there's always, you never know, like, who's hearing who's hearing what or when they need it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, that's awesome. So kind of, you know, mental health worker by night, chemist beer brewer by day (laughs) yeah pretty much pretty much so you're a social worker correct yes so is that considered a therapist yes yes okay um I know a lot of people probably ask you this question but can you explain the difference between what you do and what say a psychiatrist or a psychologist would do or can do yeah Absolutely. So when we take a look at um, the different buckets of counselor Mm -hmm. versus psychologist versus psychiatrist, or there are some people that are out there that are just considered um, counselors. So as a registered social worker, we are governed under Alberta Health Act, and we are able to perform jobs in a whole variety. So social work is very much a holistic approach that looks at maybe more social settings. Mm -hmm. 
So individuals in social work typically would work in, you know, they could work in mental health, they might work with seniors, they might work with children, they might work in um, human resources. It's so incredibly broad. But another role of a social worker is one-on-one counseling or group therapy. Then we take a look at psychologists, and they're also governed by um, Alberta Health and have a governing body, Um, and they more so focus on the psychology, the mental health and wellness of a person. Now, they may do some group therapy, but as psychologists, they typically do a lot more one-on-one work, family work, couples Mm -hmm. work. Um, They may be involved in social service types of settings. So they may work in hospitals or they may work in organizations like an organizational psychologist, but typically they look at individual work rather than how social settings impact an individual. So it's a little bit different. When we take a look at a psychiatrist, completely different role. Mm -hmm. They actually have to become medical doctors first. So they're GPs first, and then they do an additional four to six years of training. It's very, very, very hard to get into the faculty of psychiatry at any university. Typically, there's only about 10 to 15 um, individuals who are accepted. And Mm -hmm. then they have the ability to diagnose and provide medication Right. will only see people one-on-one, and they have huge wait lists. Now, some psychologists and social workers, if they do an additional training down a clinical path, can also diagnose. Psychologists sometimes can um, provide medication, but social workers typically cannot provide medication. Mm-hmm. So big difference within that. Then there's another realm of individuals that are um, – titled or called counselors, they are not governed by any health body, they're not regulated, and they are not typically covered by many insurance providers. Okay. So if psychiatry, they would be covered under your Alberta Health Benefits, social work and psychologists would be covered under maybe your employee health benefits. That's good to know. That's so much that I didn't even know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're all, they're very similar, but all very different. Yeah. The same. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people kind of look at them all as being somewhat the same. Yeah. But- and I've had people say like, I, I went and saw my psychiatrist. Um, and people often get psychiatrists and psychologists confused yeah. because they, and they're not, they're not the same at all. A psychiatrist has all the medical years of training Mm -hmm. behind them. I think people interchange those words. They Um, do. Yeah. Yes, they do interchange them. And sometimes, too, like people will get confused when I say I'm a social worker. Um, They don't necessarily understand that social workers also can do one-on-one counseling and therapy or group therapy, family, couples, Mm -hmm. because then they place that into the bucket of um, psychology. Right. So, yeah, it, and it depends on where you've specialized and what that looks like as well. But there are social workers who work with just kids or just adults. So they are interchangeable for sure, but look very different. Mm-hmm. Do you have a kind of a specialized um, branch that you focus on? Or are you just into like general social work? Yeah, so that that's a great question as well, because... When I take a look at my role as a social worker, Mm -hmm. um, I definitely specialize in particular areas. So I do work within, um, you know, kind of the, I guess, common sort of things within counseling, Mm -hmm. Um, anxiety, depression, anger management, conflict resolution, self-confidence, self-esteem. But I do specialize in suicide. Um, I'd say probably about 90% of the clients that I see right now have had thoughts, behaviors, or attempts of suicide or someone in their life that um, fits into kind of one of those buckets. So that's um, an area of real passion 
Um, uh, fine. I work with the Center for Suicide Prevention. I am a facilitator and trainer in all of the workshops that they run. Um, and I've done a ton of suicide interventions across my, you know, professional life. And um, I love it because I know that there's hope in it. And a lot of people would think really the opposite of that. But um <laughs> You know, that is one area that I really specialize in. And um, I work with a lot of women who are trying to navigate, like, who who am I? Whether mm-hmm. career-wise, you know, their kids are mostly in school. They're trying to decide on career for themselves, maybe challenges within marriage. So I work with a lot of women who are living in um, homes with maybe emotional abuse, maybe some physical abuse, um, not quite as much of that as I used to do. And um, a lot, I work with a lot of teens around self-confidence, self-esteem, dealing with bullies. So those are a couple of the areas that I um, seen a lot of people in that I that I work with. Wow, is there any areas that are kind of off limits for you, or that you won't touch? Yeah, you know, um, I've had a few people connect with me in and around grief and loss, mm-hmm. and what I mean by that is that they have had somebody in their world um, who has experienced, for example, um, miscarriage. So in those realms, I I don't, I don't work with that. Mm -hmm. Seniors love them, but it's not my jam, (laughs) you know, working with some of the complex issues with seniors in and around like Alzheimer's or um, transitioning from their home to, you know, um, other care facilities Mm -hmm. and working with the families around that. I, that's not just this not my jam um real littlies like five to eight love kids I have three of my own but don't have the patience to sit (laughs) and try and like figure out what they're drawing Mm -hmm. or how to have the conversation I just I just (laughs) can't do it I can't do it (laughs) yeah that's totally fair (laughs) Yeah, those are sort of some of the areas. And then, like, depends on the buckets of what people are connecting with me yeah. on. Um, so I have a bit of a, I have a team that works with me right now as well. So one of my um, associates, she works with ADHD and autism, which is amazing because those are not my my buckets. Mm-hmm. I have another uh, team member that's going to be joining um, in the up and coming weeks. And she works with uh, people of color and uh, racialized individuals and um, individuals who are like immigrating or, you know, kind of that new culture sort of piece of it, which is totally not for me either. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. yeah, not that I work in, right? Can I ask how you got into um, this field? Was it always something that you wanted to do? Well, it's been an interesting journey. (laughs) So um, I've been in the helping services for almost 30 years now, which is crazy for me to think a little bit about. (laughs) So when I first started, um, you know, I always had an interest in crime. Like I wanted Mm -hmm. to be you know, like the NCIS, you know, like the TV yeah, show. So did I. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think uh, so many people who are interested in like crime and real crime, you know, you're like, I'm going to yeah. be like the police on NCIS or CSI or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So I looked into doing that and some investigation work and things like that. And you have to be a police officer for about 10 years before you can actually do kind of detective and undercover work. And I'm like, oh, don't want to do that. So I started out my career working in maximum security prisons uh, up at Spy Hill in Calgary um, with adolescents and then across with adults. Um, And so I did that for about seven years. I learned a lot, had some amazing mentors. um, And I was one of five females at that time working in the prison system. There was hardly any of us in the prison system at that time. It was still really new. And so it was very 
male dominated Mm -hmm. and lots of legislation at that time. So from there, um, I then moved across to Australia. I lived there for 10 years and I worked in child and family services uh, and I did emergency removals of children from their homes. I did investigations of sexual abuse. I worked with adoptions, foster care, sort of you name it across my 10 years. Uh, Then moved back to Canada, oh my gosh, almost 10 years ago, and worked in the area of homelessness Mm -hmm. with individuals who had complex mental health. And our mandate was most complex, hardest to house. And they were. (laughs) So most of the individuals had been homeless for about 10 years years. Um, They had mental health diagnosis such as schizophrenia, bipolar, major depression. Um, Because they were all homeless, there was a real challenge in getting their medications, taking their medications, Mm -hmm. sort of that stability. So about 89% of them had also had active addictions, crack cocaine, heroin, meth, and that's how they would manage their mental health just because mm-hmm. of that lack of stability in their worlds, right? And they just needed to to deal with some of those mental health challenges. Um, and so I did that for about four years and I learned so, so much from those individuals. It was one of my favorite jobs that I ever worked um, and working with the mental health hospitals, getting to know a lot more about psychiatry and uh, mental illness and Uh, medication and all those kinds of things. And from there, because I had my third baby then, and I didn't want to go back to work full time. And Mm -hmm. that was pretty intense work. I um, started teaching in one of the universities here in uh, Calgary, in their nursing and legal programs and doing counseling with um, university students. And that was really fun, but I hated the marking. (laughs) I hated doing the marking. From there, I um, then went and worked in the realm of domestic violence, and I did that for four years. I ran a counseling program, had a department of 60, and worked, again, really closely alongside drug court, probation, parole, um, high-risk offenders, and then obviously with the women and the children who had been the survivors of domestic abuse. Um, and that kind of wrapped up about three years ago, I went full time into my private practice because I always thought, yeah, maybe I do a private practice, you know, retirement, that might be a good gig. Mm -hmm. I'm here much before retirement. Um, and I love it because I've had so much experience working with real people in real situations and real scenarios that um, I feel like I bring a very different perspective, like a real, I can truly meet you where you're at because I have seen the impacts and the effects of addiction, violence, Mm -hmm. mental health, hospitalization, policing. Um, And I've been really intentional in the way that I've set up my private practice because of those experiences. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of my pathway here 30 years on. Wow, that is such an interesting like journey. I love that. I also wanted to go into um, kind of CSI stuff when I was younger. I was going to take forensics and I I thought that I was going to become a coroner actually. Um, But that didn't happen and uh, I ended up becoming a chemist. But I was so interested in that stuff too. Uh Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it is super interesting and there's never a day that's ever the same. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I love hearing people's problems. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, I love listening to people. I love hearing their problems. I love being able to support them and see, you know, the growth and the change and, yeah. um, you know, really get them where they need to go because something that I has really highlighted for me. And I always thought I don't, I don't just want to be a counselor who sits and kind of nods their head and because I keep hearing like, I want people to ask me questions. If I knew what was wrong, I would be able to maybe figure it out. I needed to, I need to be asked questions, but I also need tools and strategies and skills. And so that's something I've been really intentional about hearing from all of the different places and spaces I've worked, whether that be in Canada or Australia, but 
also hearing people say, I need something to get unstuck, Shelly. Like, I don't know mm-hmm. how to get unstuck from, from this situation. Um, and so I give people practice all the time. And we talk about bite-sized strategies. And we talk about understanding really what our emotions are. And I'm not um, a therapist who talks about breathing exercises and meditation because mm-hmm. – those things work for sure. Mm -hmm. They definitely work in certain situations, but ultimately if we're feeling anxious or overwhelmed or something's going on for us, if we're just doing a breathing exercise, we're not getting to the root of why that's happening. Right. Right. We need to understand it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. So I know like all therapists are different. um, And a big part of finding a, uh, a therapist who you connect with and feel comfortable with So I know that you've touched on it a little bit, but what is your approach to therapy and kind of helping someone um, that needs it? Yeah, yeah. And that's 100% right. It doesn't, it almost in some cases doesn't matter what sort of evidence-based practice your therapist uses. Mm -hmm. We know, the research tells us, and humans tell us that um, how safe and connected we feel with the person who is supporting us is actually the number one. And then everything else kind of falls below that. So I work from a cognitive behavior therapy lens um, that is solution focused, that is strength based. And I also had some narrative therapy with into that. Mm -hmm. But when we think about cognitive behavior therapy, It is an evidence-based practice. It's been around a really long time. Um, And a lot of therapists who do use CBT provide a lot of worksheets, you know, journaling Mm -hmm. worksheets, because CBT is our thoughts, our behaviors, and then our responses and our reactions, our thoughts, our feelings, and our reactions. Um, And when I work with individuals, Those are the underpinnings, right? Let's talk about our thoughts. Let's talk about our feelings and how those are impacting our behaviors. But I don't do it through necessarily a worksheet. We set goals together and they are three month goals. And then we break them down to even smaller pieces. So let's say I have lots of people who come in and say, I want to feel more confident. Mm -hmm. I want to communicate better with my partner or I don't want to feel suicidal anymore. Well, those are pretty huge. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I want to communicate better. Or I don't want to feel suicidal. Those are all really big things. Yeah. And so when I work with people, we break those down into really small things. Well, for example, communication and um, anger management, suicide, self-harm, all those things are driven by our emotions and how somebody makes us feel. Mm-hmm. And so if we can understand how we're feeling about some of those things by, I I talk about our emotional backpacks, I talk about tracking what some of your emotions are, then I do a lot of whiteboard work with people where they can see, you know, their spider web of stuff, their journey, their emotions. And when people can see what's happening for them, rather than just talk it through, it's such a different perspective because Mm -hmm. we all of a sudden have something tangible that we can be like, Oh, I'm feeling like this because of all of these things that are happening in that relationship. Yeah. Or I'm feeling like this um, because of all of these things that have happened in my world, my trauma and how that's impacting me and, and my self harm or my thoughts of suicide. Mm -hmm. And so Those are the the underpinnings, right? CBT, solution-focused, strength-based, narrative approaches. Um, But I kind of put my own intentional spin on how I support people. I like that. That's awesome. So your work obviously dives into the dark parts of people's lives. And um, when you're kind of specializing in suicide and self-harm and things like that, how do you separate work from your own life and how do you leave that stuff behind when you go home yeah I love that question because you don't, oh, you don't. <laughs> I love that question Anna, because you you don't you can't mm-hmm. you know people talk about this work-life balance people talk about you know leaving work at work yeah. 
but there's no magic door that closes when you hear hard stories. There's no exactly. magic door that closes if you've had an argument or a disagreement with your partner or your child before you go to work. Mm -hmm. Those things stay with you. They don't, they're not separate. Um, yeah. And so it's really been a part of a journey for me mm -hmm. through that as well. Um, and probably the most pivotal moment, the most clear moment in my mind that I can share with you is that I was living in Australia and um, had been working in child and family services um, for about probably a year and a half or two years at that point. And I was doing um, uh, some emergency removals and investigations um, with and my partner, because we always worked with partners. She had been doing this work for, I don't know, 10 years or something already. So it was awesome being paired with somebody who had all of this experience and could be a bit of a mentor for me. Um, and her, her husband was a police officer. My husband was in the Australian military. And so I came home from work one day. It had been an exceptionally hard and challenging day um, and seeing some stuff that was tough. Um, and obviously keeping everything confidential, but sharing with my husband, like, oh my gosh, this happened and this happened. Mm -hmm. And he, he said, stop, stop, pause. <laughs> Your work is stuff that happens in bad movies. That stuff is not real life. That stuff is totally different than the work that I do. And you can't tell me. You can't, <clears throat> sorry, you can't tell me about that stuff that goes on for you. Because one, makes me terrified for you to go to work. <laughs> <laughs> Two, it gives me nightmares. And three, I don't know how it doesn't give you nightmares. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so um, he said, you need to figure this out. Like, mm -hmm. you need to figure it out. And I got a little annoyed and irritated because I was like, I thought I was supposed to share everything with you. Went to work the, the next day and talked to my, my partner, my colleague. And I said to her, like, what do you do? And she was like, oh, Shelly, you need to debrief and consult here. We know the people. We know the families. We know the work. Mm -hmm we know the feeling and the emotion because we've, we've been through it. We've seen it. We've mm -hmm. experienced it. Um, and, and then at the end of each day, she would touch base with me and be like, what do you, what happened today? Let's debrief. Let's talk about what happened. Let's talk about anything that has, um, you know, been triggering for you. Um, and that was my kind of my first step into understanding what in this type of work, supervision looks like mentoring looks like um i call it work self-care and home self-care because yeah. the way we take care of ourselves at home by you know going to the gym or socializing with friends or um netflixing you know netflix or, or whatever it is is really different than what we need to do at work especially when you're talking about horrific yeah. abuse yeah, or absolutely. people dying um and so from then on, I always had a mentor. And I, as a leader, I always did supervision with my staff. Um, and even now I'm in private practice. I will call my colleagues um, or my associates that I work with and say, I just need a debrief. Like, I, I can't manage this right now. Mm -hmm. um, and then I go to the gym. Mm -hmm. And I spend a lot of time outside. <laughs> So that was very long winded, but that's what I need to do. No, I love it. I've never really heard of the idea of self care at work, but I totally agree. That's so important. I think a lot of yeah. people could could benefit from that. Yeah, and, you know, I and I do a lot of coaching and stuff with leaders, and I do a lot of work with with organizations, and I always talk about work self care. Mm -hmm. How do you leave work at work? Because who better to talk about what the heck's going on, or a challenging client, or a experiment that went wrong, <laughs> mm -hmm. than the people who are doing it with you every day, yeah. right? Yeah. Wow. So important. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, you know, it's been a journey for me. Um, and I've been a place of being burnt out myself, mm -hmm. you know, um, and it took me about six months to kind of really overcome that from one of my previous jobs. And um, I don't ever want to get back there because it was hard and it was tough and it was emotional and it was not, not, not nice mm -hmm. for me or for probably any of my friends or family. <laughs> so do you have any advice for kind of friends or family that are supporting somebody who are struggling with their mental health? Like, how can they 
help when maybe they don't fully understand what they're going through or they they can't really comprehend what it's like living with those issues what can they do yeah that's a great question because I get this often like um you know I was just talking with a client last night and she was like I don't understand, like, why do they behave like this? Mm-hmm. Why are they acting like this? I just, you know, I've done everything I can to support them. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's not our job necessarily as caregivers, as family members to fix it. Yeah. But the role is to support. Yeah. And that might just be through listening or helping find the right resources, or a huge one is asking what they need. How can I best support you? Especially if they're in a good place at the time, you know, if you're off your medication and I can see things aren't going well, how do you want me to bring that to your attention? How do you want me to support you? Or I can Mm -hmm. see that you're kind of going into the depths of depression and things aren't going well what would be a way that you would like for me to approach you that won't feel triggering, that won't feel dismissive, that won't feel that I don't care, or that doesn't feel like I'm being a super nag to be able to bring it to your attention and to your awareness. And because we are the ones, you know, if we're the ones going, going through that, we not always, because that's a journey as well. Um, can tell people how we want support and what we need for support and how we want to have those questions asked to us. Um, Never in a million years behind us or going forward, telling someone what to do or how to manage their own mental health and wellness has ever worked. (laughs) It doesn't. Um, But I always talk about walking alongside them and journeying with them and navigating, you know, what do you feel is best for you? Do you need me to kind of kick your butt out the door to the gym or go for a walk or cook you a meal or just sit with you and listen? Mm -hmm. Um, Because ultimately when we're struggling with mental health, whether that's like a diagnosis or situational, um, we can't fix it. Yeah. Like us who are the supporters, we can't, we can't fix it. Um, And lots of people want to fix it. And even as a counselor, I can't, I can't fix you. My job is not to fix you. My job is to support you and ask you the right questions because you ultimately have the answers. You may not be able to find them on your own, but they're there. You know what you need. You know what you want, but you need the person who is your therapist or your counselor or your friend or your partner to ask you the right questions to help guide you on that way and sometimes give you just a little bit Mm -hmm. of a of a push or help you look in the dark corners that are scary and hard yeah I think that's something I've experienced as well is people a lot of people just want to fix everything um but part of struggling with mental health issues is realizing that you you just can't you can't fix it and it's not it's not something that's like curable or it's going to go away completely you know and I think a lot of people don't understand that that part of it yeah and it is like waves it's not going to be like Mm -hmm. this moment of feeling horrible forever yeah yeah but it will you know, sweep you up. I always talk to my clients about like the big emotion, the big wave, the big, you know, challenge with the mental health in that moment. That moment might be a week, that moment might be a month, but it picks you up and it swooshes you out and then it throws you back into shore and you've got like sand in your bottoms, which feels terrible. (laughs) Yes. But you're back on shore, you're breathing again, and you're able to dust yourself off and you know, then maybe the water's around your ankles Mm -hmm. and your bikini bottom is clean. (laughs) I love that. I love that analogy. That's awesome. (laughs) Because it doesn't feel good, does it? You're like, oh, that's him. (laughs) We've just been like swooshed out there and carried away. And and that's what emotions do. You know, the other thing is like being able to really understand what those emotions are that are carrying us away. And being able to, you know, as Dr. Dan Segal says, name them, to tame them, and have some tools and skills, mm-hmm. and sometimes medication to be able to manage. All of those things are totally okay. It's just what's yeah. best for us, because yeah. we're all our 
own unique humans that just want the best in our own worlds. Mm -hmm. So if somebody is supporting um, somebody who is struggling and they reveal to them that they're planning on hurting themselves or doing something, do we have like a legal responsibility to do something or yeah, I guess what, what do we do when that happens? Yeah. 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 That's a good question. So it's super interesting because this is, this is actually super common. People don't know. People ask this question all the time. Like Mm -hmm. I just have to call police right away or I have to, you know, take them to the hospital right away. That's actually the last resort. That's actually the very last thing that we do. Um, You know, depending on, on our roles and and who we are, our position is and who it is that's telling us this. So let's kind of talk a little bit about self-harm. Um, and suicide in the sense that um, suicide and self-harm are emotion-based decisions. They're not logic-based decisions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. People self-harm and get to a place of thinking about suicide because of big emotions and they don't feel like there's any other way to deal with them. So when we think about first and foremost self-harm, people can self-harm without ever ever thinking about suicide. People may self-harm their entire life, but never think about suicide. Because somebody self-harms does not mean that they're going to take their own life. But self-harm is a risk factor and could potentially lead to suicide or accidental suicide, depending on how people are self-harming, right? Because there's a whole bunch of different, different ways that people do that. Um, so when someone is self-harming, the core underpinning of it, the reason, there's two reasons people self-harm. One, because they feel so much big emotion or so much is going on in their heads that they just want to take that away and feel something physical. Mm -hmm. They just want to step out of their own brains, all those emotions, all that heaviness and feel something that's physical. So they don't have to think about that anymore. Mm -hmm. And they can focus on on that. The other reason people self-harm is because they feel so many big emotions, they're totally numb. They feel nothing. They're just kind of almost frozen. Mm -hmm. And they want to feel something so they will self-harm so they can feel feel something. It's pain, Mm -hmm. but they're feeling something. Mm -hmm. And so those are, you know, kind of the the reasons that that people self-harm. Um, when people think about suicide, it's often the same thing. Suicide is very complex, very nuanced, very individual, but people ultimately get to a place of suicide because they don't feel like there's any other way for the problem to be solved. Even if they have, you know, friends and family and a good job and sports and, you know, they have all these amazing things in their life. They feel totally alone completely isolated and there's no way to solve this problem suicide also doesn't show up because of one thing that's happened there's layers and layers Mm -hmm. and layers of it that's why it's so complex but what we know and the research shows us this globally is that talking about it is the one of the top protective factors acknowledging it not being scared to ask someone why they're feeling this way or are they thinking about suicide or I see some, you know, marks on your arms or your legs, not being afraid to have that conversation because ultimately when people are in those dark places of, of self harm or worth thinking about suicide, they, um, the vast majority of the time are not going to come to you and say, Mm -hmm. I'm so emotionally overwhelmed. I'm hurting myself or I'm thinking about dying. So as soon as we recognize, you know, something that's feeling off or change, you know, in behavior or risk or whatever our spidey senses are telling us with our person or our colleague or our neighbor, just ask how they're doing and don't let it slide like, I'm fine. It's okay. All's good. Right. That's like a typical Canadian response. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, You know, I'm seeing that 
you haven't showered for a few days, you're looking a little more sad, you've lost some weight, I smell alcohol in your breath, whatever it is, whatever you're seeing, yeah. I'm worried about you. Are you thinking about suicide? Mm -hmm. I'm worried about you. Is there something going on? Talking about it is one of the best things we can do because it breaks the stigma. It breaks yeah. the fear. It breaks the burden for that person who's feeling like they can't share it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Those difficult and honest conversations are so important. And I know a lot of people are afraid of maybe triggering something by talking about it or asking about it. So are there any like tips on how to approach those difficult conversations in like a more respectful way? Yeah. Well, I mean, first and foremost, there's nothing really that we can say that's wrong. We're just humans yeah. trying to connect with other humans. But I always find that leading it with what we've noticed is a really gentle way because it just means that we care about the person. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, hey, Shelly, I've noticed that you've been showing up to work late that you've been a little less engaged on any of our Zoom calls, your projects haven't been getting in on time. Is there something going on? I'm worried about you. Mm -hmm. You know, and just being really genuine and authentic with people. Like, have you ever been defensive or deflective or annoyed at somebody who has asked you, are you okay? These are things that I've noticed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I haven't been. The other thing that people ask me is like, can I put this thought in their mind if I ask them that question and they're not yeah, exactly. thinking about it? You can't. That is a total myth. Okay. If someone were to say to me, Shelly, are you thinking about suicide? And I wasn't, they're not suddenly going to put that thought in my head. Right. Like right. anyone who may be listening to your podcast or you and I having this conversation, if you're not thinking about suicide right now and I'm talking about it, I'm not suddenly putting that thought in your head. Yeah will yeah. already have been there floating around a little bit. That's a good point. Yeah. It's just already be it's just being acknowledged. So being genuine, being authentic, sharing what you've noticed, right? The facts, not not the I feel that you are depressed and lonely. <laughs> no. I have seen mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z. I'm worried about you. So really being able to point out the facts of what we've witnessed, what we've seen, and being able to just open that conversation. It's going to be scary if you're not used to having those conversations. Yeah. yeah. But just not, not diagnosing, I guess. Um, Nobody can diagnose yeah. unless you're that psychiatrist <laughs> that we talked about earlier. <laughs> so just being able to kind of observe and uh, point out the observations. I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Point out what you are seeing, mm -hmm. right? Like, hey, Shelly, I've noticed that when I um, came over the last three days, you haven't gotten out of bed and you haven't eaten anything. Is everything okay? Oh, I just, maybe I feel like I've got the flu or, you know, I've just been really exhausted because I went to the gym too many days or, or, you know what? Yeah, I'm just feeling really terrible. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, what's been going on for you? You know, well, you know, this and this and this. Gosh, sometimes when people are experiencing separation, uh, their kids moving out of town and COVID, they might be thinking about suicide. Is that something that you're thinking about? Mm -hmm. Well, let's find you some supports and resources because remember, we can't fix it for them. Right. They need to do that themselves. Mm -hmm. So if somebody is interested in starting therapy, um, how how do they go about doing that? Like, I guess you don't really need a referral for that. Um, no. Just a lot of so the, Google. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's a few ways. One, um, sometimes it's, this is tough for people, you know, asking friends mm -hmm. who maybe they go to or um, talking to people about maybe some of their experiences. So being able to ask people sometimes about mm -hmm. what their experiences have been, I get a lot of my referrals through word of mouth, but also um, there is a website called psychology today and they have 
hundreds of thousands of therapists across North America on it. So you have to filter. But that's another way that you can take a look at, you know, if you're looking specifically for couples therapy in relation to, you know, um, particular reasons, infertility, couples therapy, infertility, and depression, you know, you can filter those things. So there's that, of course, there's Dr. Google that you can utilize as well. Um, but something that I would like to highlight for people I do myself, I think is really important is um, most therapists offer a 15, 20, or 30 minute free consultation call. Um, okay. where you can get to know them, where you can ask them questions, check out their website. Um, I think it's so incredibly important to have that free phone call first and ask the questions and see if you click. Because mm -hmm. you can usually tell pretty quickly. Yeah. Even myself as a therapist, I'm like, mm, I don't think they're going to call me back. I, yeah. We just <laughs> we didn't gel, right? Right. Um, so I think, you know, that is so important. And even, you know, there's been times that I've looked for therapy for my for myself for different reasons. And um, I've experienced the therapist's admin assistant or support person calling me back. I won't even bother booking an appointment with them because I want to talk to the person who is meant to be helping me. Yeah. So you can probably weed through a lot of counselors um, that aren't going to fit for you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes one of the other things that people look for is um, who we're covered with for benefits. Because right. if I'm not covered right. by a certain service provider, yeah. you won't be able to claim that on your benefits. So yeah. sometimes people weed out that way as well. That's yeah. a good point. Definitely yeah. have that call. Have that call with people. Okay. Um, you also have a podcast yourself called Your Fiercely Fabulous Life which I love. That's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah. What made you decide to start that one? Cause you started it, I guess, in the midst of the pandemic. Yes. So <laughs> funny that, um, you know, all of us were making these pandemic goals, <laughs> yeah. trying to be creative and do something <laughs> different. And I had actually been wanting to start a podcast for about a year I just did not know how. I was like, I did yeah. not know this technology. I don't know how to do this. So pandemic came and I was at home and all of my training and facilitation that I had been booked for, because January to March is my busiest time for that, all got canceled. So suddenly I had all of these hours and I was like, wow, I have this time now and this is something I've been wanting to do um, and I had a bit of an idea of sort of a focus I wanted to go with it and yeah I was able to get it up and running so it's been a year now um, and now I'm finally finding my groove and being consistent and you know talking mainly to women who are entrepreneurs but also moms and women who are trying to navigate you know this wild world of yeah. work momming mental health all of these different pieces um and just trying to empower women a little bit of time to live you know your fiercely fabulous life and sometimes it's fierce and sometimes it's fabulous <laughs> <laughs> i love that that's amazing so where where can people find your podcast is it everywhere Yes, yeah, Apple, Spotify, Anchor, you Google it, you will find it. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have just a couple questions that I like to ask um, most of my guests. So sure. um, for you, what is your favorite thing to do for self-care or to relax and unwind from everything? Yeah definitely hitting the gym I yeah. love going to the gym that's a huge part um, of my mental wellness when I'm hearing the big stories so not only like that work self-care we talked about that's a huge 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 piece of me it does impact my mental health and wellness yeah. if I'm not getting to the gym so I love doing that but I also love being out camping and hiking living in Calgary that can be hard and tricky in the winter months um, and so I do have three kids I love just spending time with them laughing the occasional um, bath lived in Australia for 10 years. I like a glass of wine. 
<laughs> and reading a book that has nothing to do with work. Yes. Yeah. You sound just like me. <laughs> <laughs> they love those pieces of it. Yeah. yeah. And then socializing, but you know, that looks so different right now. I mean, yeah. if I could hang out with friends and do a barbecue every weekend, I would love it. But oh, that would be amazing. I know. <laughs> and travel. I like to travel. But again, you know, those two things aren't really on my list right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, one more. Um, is there a stigma or a misconception surrounding mental health that bothers you the most or that you hear most often that isn't true? Mm, that's a good one. I think that fixing it, you know, mm-hmm. is yeah. a really big one. Like, why don't they just get help and fix it? Or my kids are like this. Why can't you, Shelly therapist, just fix it? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, people make the choice to want to get better or people make the choice to not not get better I think maybe that might not be the right choice of words people make the decision to want to improve their lives Mm -hmm. in different ways and that can be exceptionally hard um, if we don't have the right supports because even though sometimes we are the ones going to therapy and wanting to make the changes the rest of our world is not changing we're still living with the same partner kids aren't involved in the therapy Um, So nothing gets fixed by anyone but ourselves. And so that's a challenge for me um, when I think about those, you know, those myths. And the other one is um, if someone thinks about suicide or they've had an attempt in the past that it's kind of hopeless, you know, Mm -hmm. like that Mm -hmm. they've got this sort of dark cloud following them around when I absolutely a thousand times over have seen the hope behind suicide when people have conversations and are not afraid of it. Mm -hmm. And I think the hopelessness that people see or sense around suicide, I think is such a myth because there is so much hope. People just need, need support and conversation. Um, And yes, sometimes people do die by suicide and that's horrible. There's a lot of hope. I absolutely agree with that 100%. Well, that is all the questions that I had for you. Um, Is there anything else that you wanted to touch on um, that we didn't? No, I think there was lots of great questions. Um, I guess, you know, if if people want to reach out or have more questions or want resources, they can always just pop onto my website. I've got a ton of resources listed there. Anything from, you know, distress center to suicide supports or the food bank, you know, the whole (laughs) realm of things. Um, And people can find me on all the social media platforms, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, or my websites. And happy to support in any way I need be. And thank you so much for having me on. Well, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate um, your expertise and uh, your honesty and your vulnerability as well. Um, I think this was a great conversation. I'm so happy that you could join me today. Thank you. It was great. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Feel free to reach out at any time. You can contact me on Instagram and Facebook at StompTheStigmaYYC, and you can email me at StompTheStigmaYYC at gmail.com. If you like the podcast, please like and subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Apple Podcasts. And if you or someone you know would like to come on, I would love to have you share your story, speak your truth, and together we can stomp the stigma.